The subject of today's lesson is the proper use of science. Now, science is presented as, as reality, as uh, the ultimate proof. Someone says, well, science proves this, or science says that, then people immediately believe it. But you have to understand that science is simply a tool. It's no different than any other tool. It's really, really good at some things, and it is totally useless at other things. Now, for instance, a fishing pole. A fishing pole is used for fishing. That's what it's used for, to catch fish. Now, in this case, before I go fishing, it turns out the screw is loose on my reel, um, so I need to tighten the, 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 the screw before I can go fishing. And, you know, you gotta get it in here so I can get the screw tightened. You don't use a hammer to tighten a screw. You've got to have a screwdriver so the right tool fits exactly into the part and then you can tighten the screw and then you can go fishing. Well, even after I get the screw tightened, you know, then you've got to put bait onto the fishing pole if you're gonna catch a fish. So in this case, I've got my bait. When that fish grabs onto the lure, he's gonna be caught and I can bring him back, okay? He'll have a staple in his mouth. So now I can cast my bait out there and catch me a fish, right? Well, you realize it is absolutely ridiculous because I'm using the wrong tool. I don't have something that is actually gonna work in the application I desire. Now, science is the same way. Science is really, really good at understanding the operation of the universe, the operation of biological molecules, the operation of the instincts of animals, the operation of physics and how things come together. But it does not tell us where things came from. You understand, no scientist has a time machine. No scientist has ever went back in time to see how things form. But the very laws and the very observation of science do show us whether it's possible for things to have formed themselves, whether it's possible for life to have transformed from one type of creature into another, whether it's possible for the parts to come up together in their incredible complexity to have created a living creature when you examine that creature. Now, people have made this mistake throughout time. You understand that God has told us where things came from. That is the correct tool when we're trying to understand where did things come from. Consult someone who was there to see it happen. Even great men of history, great founders of our own country, men such as Thomas Jefferson, he had a philosophical viewpoint where he revered science, he revered human knowledge. Uh, he was very infatuated with the French society and, and European knowledge. But at that time, at the time of Jefferson, they were already walking away from God's word, considering the source, the right tool for understanding how to know why things exist, irrelevant. Do you understand what Thomas Jefferson did? He actually went through the Gospels, the, the early parts of the New Testament, and every time he came to a miracle of Jesus, he wrote it out. He rewrote the Bible because his mindset was, the world operates by natural processes. Because it operates that way now, it's always been that way in the past. It'll always be that way in the future, and therefore miracles must not be reality and he rewrote God's word based on his desires, his perceptions. If things always operate the way they do now, there's always been death and disease. Where is God? What's his relevance anyway? Uh, and he missed what the truth is because he misused the tool of his intellect, not understanding that observation only can reveal way, the way things operate now. They don't explain where they came from. So let's take a look at the marvels of the biological world using the tool of science to find out what it really tells us about where things came from and then compare it with the correct tool for understanding the past, which is God's word.
You know, if you take the whole evolution, uh, creation, controversy, where people are trying to figure out where did we come from, it really boils down to only two possibilities. You see, if you look at the entire universe, like it's a box, as, as if this is a box had to have come from somewhere, either the box made itself or the box has a box maker. Uh, now this turns out to be a jewelry box. If you look inside of it, it's got all these finely crafted bracelets and necklaces and beaded jewels and so on. Either the jewels made themselves and just somehow appeared inside the box, or the jewels have a jewel maker. Uh, now, the jewels might represent the finely crafted, beautiful giraffes and whales and rainforests and ants and enormous oak trees and so on. Either they made themselves something turned into something else that turned into them, or they have a creator. Now those are the only two possibilities to explain the box and what's in the box, the, the universe and the creation and what's in the universe. Now it's really obvious to even a small child which one's true, but somehow it's not obvious to university biology, physics, astronomy professors. They, they, they are always looking to try to understand how did it make itself. And it's called evolution in various ways, shapes, and forms. Now, how does science work to figure out which one is true? I mean, science has created electronics and computers and put man on the moon and huge medical advances. You'd think it'd be able to figure this out too. Well, it actually does. But this is how science works. There was a man named Dr. Karl Popper. He was a science theorist and he developed a idea that he called the white swan test to determine is something science or not? And it's like this. All science starts with an idea. Uh, I believe the box made itself. That would be like saying, I believe all swans are white. It, a hypothesis, a theory, it's just an idea that you go and you collect information to see if your idea is right in the simplest terms. So if my theory, my hypothesis is all swans are white, how do I use science to find out if that's correct or not. Well, you gotta get data. You have to collect information to see if it fits. So suppose I went out and I went all over my state on my summer break and I collected thousands of bits of information in my scientific notebook and I saw that every swan that I found on every lake and every river was always white. Have I now used scientific observation to prove every swan on earth is white? I think if you think about it, you'd realize, well, no, I haven't been everywhere. Ah, but we live in the age of information. Suppose I Facebook my friends who email their friends, who Twitter their friends, and they know people in Australia and Germany and the Polynesian Islands and Africa and South America, and I get millions of people writing back with hundreds of millions of observations. Every country on the earth is represented all of them have only seen white swans. Have I now scientifically proven every swan on the planet is white? Well, it turns out, no, I haven't. Everybody'd have to be a perfect observer. Nobody could have blinked at the wrong time. Nobody could be a liar. Nobody could have forgotten to go somewhere. Nobody could know if there's a recessive gene inside of a swan that would eventually turn out to be a black swan and just hadn't developed yet. And on and on and on. But there is a way I could use science to absolutely 100% for sure know the truth. And that's if I found a black swan. Then I would know the truth. You see what's going on in our entire education system? There's two possibilities for our existence. Either the box made itself or the box has a box maker. But students are only shown evidence which seems to imply the box made itself. It's called evolution, cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, biological evolution. It's just the idea, the story, that the box made itself. And yet the very laws of science have been designed to tell us this could not possibly be true. It's exactly like wanting to believe all swans are white, only showing students the white swans and not even allowing them to see the black swans. And that's what we're going to look for in this session.
We're here at the U.S. Rocket and Space Museum in Huntsville, Alabama, which I thought would be a great background uh, to talk about one of the men who was considered to be the top astronomer, top cosmologist, all through the 70s and 80s, a man by the name of uh, Dr. Carl Sagan. Now, he had written a very, very famous book called Cosmos and then produced a multi-million dollar, multi-part video presentation explaining where everything came from, where the universe, where time, matter, energy, stars, all of life came from. This series was widely used to train the students of the day to think about science, and they became the teachers in today's school system. Now, just to show you how even a brilliant man can be totally blinded to how he is misusing the tool of science, both Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos, and his series opened with the following statement. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Now just think about that for a second. Can you test that statement in a scientific laboratory? Can you go everywhere in the universe and test there is nothing else except time, space, energy, and matter? Can you go back in time and find out that's all there ever was? Can you go forward into the future and figure out that's all there ever will be? You understand that is not a statement of science. It's a statement of philosophy, a religious viewpoint. It is not science, and yet he is presenting it as if it's a scientific fact. You understand Carl Sagan was an atheist, and had he promoted his book and his series throughout our culture in the 70s and 80s as God does not exist, God has never existed, and God never will exist, it wouldn't have taken hold of our culture. But instead, he pretends that science supports what he has to say. But it's not science, it's just a philosophical viewpoint. And that's what we're gonna look at in this lesson. What do the laws of science show? And what's the difference between scientific interpretation and scientific fact? There are two different viewpoints of science that present themselves both as if they were equally valid, equally authoritative. One of those ways of using science correctly as a tool is operational science. Now when people think about scientists and they think about really, really smart people, they often think, Wow, I'm not a rocket scientist. How can I know what the truth is? But you understand the folks who use science to send mankind to the moon, they used operational science. They understood the exact uh, laws of gravity, the motions of the planet, how much force was needed to send something to accelerate it to the point where it escaped the Earth's gravitational field, reached the moon, and return again. All stuff that was observable, testable, reproducible in the laboratory. But there's another thing that presents itself as equally valid called speculative science. Now speculative science deals with things in the past that can never be tested or things that are based on philosophical concepts that just have some data to fit into that concept that aren't necessarily true. The examples of that abound around us. The idea that the DNA code wrote itself, the idea that one form of animal could turn into a completely different form of animal. Those are all speculative sciences because we don't see it happening in the world around us today. You need to understand that God wants the truth to be known. He has told us he's made the truth obvious so that we can know it. Now let me take you to a couple of verses of scripture that lay this out so clearly. Now, this is uh, Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 19. Now, just listen to the words. That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. Now, manifest means obvious, and the them in this scripture is everybody. Everybody, everywhere, throughout time, no matter where they live, any place in the world, in the past or in the present, God says, what may be known about him is obvious. Now let me go on to verse 20. It says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You understand every person 
ever created is without excuse for belief in God because of what he has made. Now it is by understanding and observing the very laws of science that we know God exists. Let me give you an example. The very foundational first law of science, the first law of thermodynamics, says that matter and energy can never be created and never be destroyed. Now think about the box we talked about earlier. If you envision the entire universe as a box, either the box made itself or the box has a box maker. Now the law of science says matter can't make itself. So what is the correct answer for where the box came from? It has to have been made by somebody outside of the time, space, matter universe. Time, space, matter, everything we see, touch, feel, and hear exists because somebody made it. The very laws of science tell us this. Now, lest you think I am exaggerating when I say the whole world around us is teaching the universe just made itself, I want you to, you to watch a little video that I found on YouTube by a professor of astrophysics by the name of Jana as she explains where did everything come from. Watch this interesting little video clip. I'm Jana and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. I work on where it all started. The simplest picture of the Big Bang starts with nothing. There's really nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no matter, there's no energy. It's nothing but the potential to exist. And out of that bursts the universe. Time starts, space is created, all of the matter and the energy in the universe is born at that moment. In the first minute fraction of a second, the universe inflates. And then about three minutes later, atoms begin to form. And about five billion years later, galaxies begin to form. One of these galaxies, about 10 million years later, a little ordinary planet forms. And 14 billion years later, people evolve. We're at the last bleep um, in the cosmic history. The Big Bang is often misunderstood as an explosion in space, as though space existed and time existed, and there was just this explosion of matter and energy into space. But something much more profound than that is going on, and that is space itself is created in the Big Bang, and time is created in the Big Bang. The Big Bang describes the origin of the entire universe. But we also know that the math that we're doing on pen and paper isn't going to be the whole story. It's possible that the universe was really a bounce from a previous history when the universe was already big and started to collapse and bounced out into a new Big Bang. And then we were born in this cosmos that we think started 14 billion years ago, but really it goes back infinity to infinity. Uh, an eternity of bounces and cycles like this. Or it's possible that our universe is just one kind of bubble or plume off of a patchwork of other bubbles and plumes. And so there's other universes out there. It's like a megaverse, but we can't contact them. And so for all we know, this is it. This is the whole cosmos back to our beginning and our Big Bang. But it might not be that way. But we know something happened, something that created a hot space from which the universe expanded and evolved. Now, did you notice how many times she said maybe, probably, could have, perhaps? That's your clue that what she is talking about is not operational science, it's speculative science. It's a story to try to explain everything as if God has never been involved. That's not reality, that's storytelling. That's not science, that's speculation. At the very beginning, she said, in the beginning, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, but the potential to become something and then it turned into everything. Now, you understand what science shows us? Nothing can do nothing. Nothing be can become nothing. Nothing can transform nothing. It is nothing. To believe it could become everything in the universe is fantasy, not reality. And then she talks about, well, maybe the universe, it expanded and collapsed and expanded and collapsed and expanded and collapsed. Well, it eventually is gonna wind down. It can't be eternal. Things can't go on forever. That's another law of science. And then she wrapped up by talking about, well, perhaps our universe is just one of a multiverse and there's an infinite number of universes. 
Well, the word universe means all that is. So even that doesn't work. It's, it's once again, if there are multiple universes, you can't see them, you can't touch them, you can't test them, you can't do an experiment on them, you can't know in any way, shape, or form that they exist. But it's fantasy, not reality. It's storytelling, not science. Another law of science that points to the reality that everything around us has to have a creator is the second law of thermodynamics. Now this law of science says everything is moving from a state of order to a state of disorder. It never goes in reverse if just left to itself. Heat always flows from hot to cold and everything becomes lukewarm eventually. You understand what this law of science is telling us? We see the entire universe winding down. Stars are exploding in supernovas. Genetic mistakes are building up. Things are not getting more and more improved with time. Animals are going extinct. If you don't maintain your bodies, if you don't maintain your car and your home, eventually it will just wear out, deteriorate, and fall apart. That is a law of science to which there aren't exceptions. Now, folks who believe in evolution, they would say, well, you know, if something is an open system, if energy is allowed into a given container, then things can improve. If you look at an acorn, which is a fairly simple structure, given time it could turn into an enormous oak tree, which is a far more complex structure. But when you hear these kind of things, what's being ignored is that the programming to produce the oak tree was already in the acorn. It already existed. Where did that programming come from? Energy coming into a set of materials does not by itself randomly improve those materials. You couldn't put a stick of dynamite in a bunch of building materials and set off the dynamite, kaboom, and have it turn into a building. We know this, it would never happen. But that doesn't even touch on the idea of where does all the time, space, matter, energy, stars, galaxies in the universe come from. They couldn't have made themselves. The entire universe has been wound up and it is winding down. Now again, in that little clip from Jana, you heard this idea that, well, maybe the universe is expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting, and we're just in the middle of one of these cycles. Well, think about that. If you have a slinky or a spring and you stretch it and it bounces back, it may bounce back and bounce back and bounce back, but it will always eventually wind down and come to a stop. See, the second law of thermodynamics is there to show us things can't be infinitely old. They had to have had a beginning. It points to the fact that we have a creator. That is what the laws of science show us. A third example of a law of science, which is there so we can know what the truth is, is the law of biogenesis. Now that law of science basically says life only comes from previously existing life. Now this is pointed out in textbooks. In the 1700s, scientists would see life coming out of piles of garbage and dung, uh, beetles and worms, and, and yet there didn't seem to be anything there. Uh, they didn't know where they came from. They knew nothing about microscopic organisms. They didn't believe they existed at this point in, in uh, human development. So they had to come up with a idea they believed life spontaneously generated itself. And by the way, this belief was widespread all the way up into the 1800s, even at the time of Darwin, until Louis Pasteur came along and he ran a series of experiments where he totally sterilized food and then covered it. And he found out life never comes into existence unless there's already life that's been deposited there, eggs and seeds and microorganisms. Once it's sterilized, it led to the pasteurization of milk. He realized that life doesn't just appear. And every single experiment that every single scientist and every biologist and every geneticist has ever done in the history of scientific exploration has confirmed the fact that life only comes from previous previously existing life. You see, chemicals could never come together to just come alive. That's what observational science shows us. But then you fast forward in the biology book, you come to the area on evolution, and it will imply that somehow 
chemicals came together to form proteins and cell membranes and, and, and little organisms in the DNA code road itself. There's not an iota of evidence supporting this as reality. Every experiment done shows it doesn't happen, and yet it's presented as if it's a fact. Now, is that science or is that speculative religion using little bits and pieces of science to make it sound credible? See, that's the difference. You must train yourselves to separate the difference between the laws of science, which are testable and observable, and religious speculation, which is trying to explain everything without God. Because without God, we think we escape accountability. If there's no God, we can do what we want. We can behave the way we want. We can have the morality we want. And that's exactly what we see happening in the world all around us. A speculative religion masquerading itself as if it's science versus hard, true, observational science, which is what the laws of science show us. The, the box has to have a box maker. Now, also at the beginning of this segment, I talked about the white swan test to determine what is science and what isn't science. You understand the laws of science when you have two options, either the box made itself or the box has a box maker. You can't literally scientifically prove either one with observational science. We don't see life popping into existence. We don't see dogs turning into something that aren't dogs, just varieties of dogs. But we also don't see creation. We don't see animals being created today. That is done, and God told us he is done with creation. It is a perfect creation at the end of day six. So how do you figure out what is true and what isn't true using science? Well, if something totally contradicts what you wish to believe, you can figure out what is the least likely option to be true. And that's what we've done in this segment. You see, the very first law of thermodynamics says matter and energy can never be created and never be destroyed. That is enormously strong evidence that the option, the box made itself, couldn't be true. We haven't proven the creation option is true, but it's like this enormous black swan. The entire education system is like training everybody to believe all swans are white. The box made itself, that option is true. The laws of science say, here's a black swan. No, matter and energy couldn't have made itself. The laws of science say things aren't getting better and better and better all by themselves. Things aren't evolving upwards, they're deteriorating downwards. That's like a black swan. The laws of science say life couldn't just appear as you mix chemicals together. That's a black swan. See, it doesn't prove creation, but it totally shows the belief in evolutionary processes couldn't possibly be true. And honestly, that only leaves the creation option because God wants the truth to be known. He wants you to know he exists. And that's why, as we look at the creation, it is obviously the truth. Now we're going to wrap up with a film that shows the implications and the consequence of teaching somebody to think in only one possible way. And it uses a very common example, how do we ride a bicycle? Let's watch this sequence. Hey, it's me Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. 
My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels, every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're going to try some trick or they're just going to power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. Okay. All right, I'm just like, <laughs> All right, so, uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. Quick, quick! No, no, you have to keep your feet on. The... <laughs> 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 Just keep your feet on the pedals. Pedals on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more time, one more time. Wait, okay. Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, Sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you gonna give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. I felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Now as you watched this particular um, sequence of, of this teacher, who tried to ride a bicycle where you would turn the handle in the opposite way than you had been trained to think, his brain couldn't do it. It took him eight months to learn to retrain his brain to think in the opposite way that it had been trained to think. Now, interestingly enough, his young child, a five-year-old boy, it only took him a matter of weeks. Do you understand the travesty, the damage, I think the actual evil that is going on throughout the public education system in the entire Western civilization. Children are systematically being trained to think in only one possible way. Millions and billions of years this, millions and billions of years that, millions of years, billions of years, hundreds of millions of years. Everywhere they go, they see it, they hear it over and over and over again. It becomes the framework of reality and truth through which they will filter everything to the point they can't even consider the possibility that anything else could be true. And it totally ignores the biblical viewpoint that there has been a worldwide flood. Those time frames are fantasy. The rock layers were laid down very, very rapidly, even when you put absolutely obvious examples right in front of them. You see, God told us over and over and over and over again, make my word the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path. Write my precepts upon your heart. Meditate on my word day and night. Transform your mind 
with God's Word, with the mind of Christ Jesus. You see, if we leave the Bible out, we're going to misinterpret the world to the point where we can't even see the truth when it's right in front of our face. That's why this issue is so important. That's why we've got to keep putting the truth in front of people in a very credible way, accompanied by the evidence of why it is the truth, because it will impact lives, it will impact thinking, and it will lead people to trusting God's Word and God Himself in a much more personal, mighty, and confident way. So how do evolution believers justify the idea that everything popped into existence from nothing when the laws of science say matter and energy can never be created nor destroyed? Well, they basically put their faith in two things. One is future discoveries. You heard the maybes, probabilities, could be's, possibilities as you heard Jana talk in, this, in the sequence in this session. That is another way of saying, well, we can't figure it out now, but maybe in the future we'll figure it all out. See, that's faith. That isn't science. It's just faith that God wasn't involved and therefore will figure it out someday. The other thing is lots of mathematical manipulation. Uh, probably the man who's acknowledged to be one of the most brilliant mathematical minds of today, Stephen Hawking from Cambridge University, um, he's come out with a book that said he can explain how the entire universe came from nothing. He can mathematically prove that it's possible now. And, he, and he's very popular among scientific circles because supposedly he's now explained things without God. But what he did was start with gravity. By starting with gravity, he can then show how things could have come into existence and matter could have come into existence and therefore all the energy and matter eventually formed. Or they'll throw things like there was a fluctuation in the time-space continuum of the cosmic egg that fluctuated and then everything burst into existence. Well, that's just words. And how could gravity exist before you have the material time-space universe because gravity is part of that time-space universe. You see, it always has to start with something and the assumptions are left out of the thinking of the students as they're told these things. So it is really two-faced. It's a faith that the box made itself versus a faith that the box has a box maker. And I would contest that one of those faiths is far more scientifically accurate and testable than the other. But I don't want to end on a negative view. What I really would like to end with is a story. It's a story that actually happened in America's space program, and this is a great location to be talking about that. Uh, once again, what you see behind me is a Saturn V rocket. Now America sent men to the moon in rockets such as this that you see behind me. It was a program that lasted for over 10 years and involved up to 700,000 people working in America's military space program with the goal of sending a man to the moon and bringing him back safely. Now in one of these missions, Apollo 13, there was a major problem. There's a classic line uh, as the astronaut at that time as his spacecraft is on its way to the moon said, Houston, we have a problem. What had happened was there was an explosion that destroyed a large part of their oxygen and power source. They knew they could not now land on the moon and return safely, but the problem was they didn't even have enough power left to power their thrusters, slingshot around the moon, and head back at exactly the right trajectory while changing their course on the way back. They only had enough power and fuel to make one adjustment as they came around the moon. Now, it was said by the engineers of the day, if they were at too steep of an angle when they hit the Earth, they would have burnt up like a meteorite. If they were too shallow of an angle, they would have bounced off the Earth's atmosphere. They had to hit from the moon, the Earth's atmosphere, at such an angle, it would be like throwing a dart across the room and hitting the tip of that dart on the exact edge of a sheet of paper. That's the accuracy at which they had to aim that spacecraft, and they only had one shot to do it. 
that. I talked to Elsie Geralds. He was one of the space engineers working at NASA at this time in the 1970s. He said nobody thought those men would ever make it back to Earth alive. Now here's what's interesting. President Nixon at that time went on TV, he asked the entire nation, almost 300 million people in America to pray for these astronauts and the miraculous happened. They not only were able to make the correction absolutely perfectly, but as they had to shut down all the power and for days travel back from the moon to the earth, with all no heat in that spacecraft and repair things in, in order to allow their oxygen equipment to continue to remove CO2 so they could survive. Everything came together. Even as their bodies were shutting down from the cold, they were able to control that spacecraft and get it to splash down and survive the trip back. When we honor God, when we go to Him with our needs, He gives us the creativity, He gives us the ideas, He gives us the technology, He gives us the understanding, but then He works with us in a miraculous way in order to bring salvation. Those astronauts were saved, and He's also provided salvation for us through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to hang on to. Yes, trust in our own abilities, but far more trust in what God has done for us.